Hey, how's it going? Today's video on Al's Geek Lab is a very special one. Not just for me, but for anyone who enjoyed the games like Leisure Suit Larry, Space Quest, King's Quest, Gabriel Knight, Phantasmagoria, it goes on and on. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Ken Williams. <laughs> Imagination. It starts with an innovative concept, translates to a visual understanding, and then transforms into a technological revolution. Creating PC software entertainment for nearly a decade, Sierra Online has stretched our imagination with its legendary software. From its inception in 1979 through to its end around 2008, Sierra Online made games that have a special place in many of our hearts. Two people were responsible for the Sierra that most of us know, Ken and Roberta Williams. The husband and wife team had direct involvement in the design, coding and business operations for close to 20 years. They were pivotal to the brand. And in 2014, they were awarded the Gaming Industry Icon Award. Without Ken and Roberta, the landscape of computer gaming would have been very different. They pioneered the graphical adventure gaming genre as well as many others and inspired the hearts and minds of so many. Ken and Roberta were there at the beginning, defining the pathway for the industry to follow. Today I speak to one half of the Sierra founders, Ken Williams, where I'll ask him all sorts of questions about Sierra, the games, the company, the people and its history. Ken has a new book out next month entitled Not All Fairy Tales Have Happy Endings, which gives an exciting insight into the inner workings of the company and the industry that Ken and Roberta helped define. Check out his website, kensbook.com, to reserve your copy of the book. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, it's only Ken Williams. Hello, Ken. Hi, Hi. how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming along. Honored to be here. All right, so I've got a whole bunch of questions for you. Um, and hopefully, I don't want to keep you too long. I appreciate it. it's, uh, it's getting late for you where you are. Um, so yeah, I'll try not to, uh, try not to take too long. Um, so first of all, the, the question I have, which, uh, which interests me, and I haven't heard part of the story, I guess, about what you did in the days before Sierra. And so I was kind of interested about, you know, I heard you know, bits and pieces that you were doing a Fortran compiler, and, but I didn't, I didn't know, what, what, were you working in a, a, in a nine to five that you were doing the Fortran compiler? What was, what was Ken's life before oh. Sierra? No, I was doing all kinds of stuff. I was um, into the computer field early and um, working for um, big IBM mainframes that filled rooms and had the air conditioned floors and uh, were noisy. I was programming on them, and I was kind of a um, expert in uh, online systems, and that's why Sierra originally started with the uh, name Online Systems, and then later we changed it when we moved up to the mountains. But um, I was doing work for everybody in LA uh, because there weren't many programmers that uh, well, there just weren't a lot of programmers in those days. It was a new business, um, yeah, and I was kind of the expert, so I went for. Um, Got every company you can imagine in Los Angeles, McDonald Douglas, Beacons Moving and Storage, Children's Hospital of LA, uh, worked for Groman's, a mortuary, worked for uh, Victoria, uh, not Victoria, uh, Fredericks of Hollywood, worked for, which was kind of a Victoria's Secret kind of place, worked for, God, every, I mean, I must have worked for 20 companies. I had a full-time job at all times. Well, let's see, informatics, doing uh, compiler development for them. And, um, yeah, I, I was working a full-time job plus evenings and weekends and um, uh, working hard, uh, sitting mostly in LA traffic, driving back and forth to work. Uh, so I'd do an hour each way every day and hated it and always wanted to live in the mountains and was trying to think of a business to start. And uh, me and another guy at a company called Informatics I worked for were constantly trying to um, see if we could start something entrepreneurial. And when we heard of uh, the TRS-80, the kind of the first computer, the uh, Trash-80 we used to call it, yeah. uh, we decided that well, Microsoft started with selling uh, BASIC for the uh, TRS-80. 
And so I said, well, let's do a Fortran compiler. And uh, he and I started programming that. And then uh, Roberta came up with the idea of doing a game and, you know, kind of the rest is history. Mm. So that's a long answer to your question. No, that's a great answer. So, um, so online systems, and when you said you're online, obviously this predates the internet and, you know, bulletin boards and all that sort of stuff by a very long time. So exactly what did it mean online at the time? Well, at the time there were um, terminals that were uh, almost like computers, although they were just text. Uh, they were kind of big boxy things called the uh, IBM 3270, and they'd typically be hardwired to a mainframe computer, but they were um, fairly intelligent. You actually had to program almost like HTML for them. And um, so they were networks and there was databases. There was a database called IMSDB that I programmed in that um, kind of looked like a precursor of SQL. And um, yeah, so it was indeed online, but it wasn't, uh, it was all, um, kind of uh, proprietary communications. There was no common internet. In fact, the internet didn't come along until um, after Sierra, and Sierra ran for almost 20 years. So uh, this is prehistoric by those mm. days. Yeah. Oh, and it makes me feel old. <laughs> I I'm feel old too. Old. <laughs> um, so the, and just, just finally then on that aspect, I, I heard that you worked remotely for a while using teletypes, is that, is that right? Yeah, that's um, how Sierra kind of got started. Um, we still, uh, Roberta and I have been debating what uh, company I had the teletype for, and we think it might have been Children's Hospital of LA that I had a teletype at home. And um, I was just goofing around looking for games on it, and it was uh, paper tape operated. It wasn't even, um, had a keyboard, but there was no floppy disk or cassette tape in those days. And uh, I was hunting around on the uh, computer and uh, discovered the old Crowther Woods um, adventure game where it says you're standing in front of a well and uh, you're supposed to type something like look well, at which point, uh, or go house or go north or go south. And, uh, but it, it was kind of cool. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that before and it really sucked me in. I started playing and told Roberta, uh, check this out. And it was uh, literally text. I mean, it was typing on a screen. Well, it wasn't even a screen. It was, I think, a printer that it was typing on. And um, Roberta kind of took the computer away from me or the teletype and uh, wouldn't give it back. And <laughs> I remember playing all night and finishing the game. And she thinks it took a couple of weeks. And um, maybe it did. I, you know, or maybe she's played all night and then did some more later. But she uh, was addicted to it, and that was kind of the start of Sierra. So amazing! And this was all pre what 1979, because that's when you guys started, yeah, 1979. right? 1979. I got my um, PRS80. That one. That one I bought for myself in uh, kind of like August of '78, and um, uh, by by Christmas I was already hating the TRS80, and the <laughs> Apple II computers came out, and they looked so much better that uh, Roberta bought me for Christmas, a uh, Apple II. And, um, and then uh, she talked me into programming her game for her, uh, which became Mystery House. And I really did that more on a, uh, well, I don't know, just to keep her happy. I thought of it as this isn't gonna be a big deal. It'll take me a, you know, a few evenings or something. And it wound up taking a couple of months, but, uh, but that's working part-time. This was yeah. not a complex game as I was still working full time plus all kinds of contract gigs. So whenever I found time, I had uh, spend it programming her game for her and uh, really saw it as kind of get her happy and then I can go back to doing my compiler. But uh, people liked uh, her game way better than the idea of my compiler. So um, yeah, she reminds me of that all the time that she was really the founder of Sierra that doing her game. And I tell her that, you know, had I done Fortran, it'd probably been us that was Microsoft. And um, yeah, and we, we'd, we'd have been a lot bigger company, maybe. We'll never know. <laughs> what would you have preferred, though? I mean, it's uh, been a, probably been a crazy uh, You know, I, I, was always, I was always more serious in that, um, even, even with Sierra, I was always trying to push us in um, serious directions, kind of away from games. 
I mean, games, games were great, but if you look at the early days in Sierra, we did publish um, uh, Lisa, the assembler, and we published uh, Superscript, the word processor, and uh, Homeward, the word processor. So we, we did do serious stuff, all of which failed miserably. So, yeah, uh, there's a whole area to um, the serious side, as you call it, that um, I just, I didn't know about before. Were there any other tools or apps that um, you guys released over the over the years? Well, I mean, toward the end, I, what, what I was always trying to evolve Sierra toward was a third of revenue in education, a third in uh, what I called productivity, and a third in games. And um, we never got there, but we, I thought we had the right uh, pieces in place to get us there. You know, toward the end, we had landscape design. Uh, we launched an encyclopedia. We had... Uh, gardening design. I was trying to come at it sideways so that I wouldn't compete directly with Microsoft or anybody else. Um, in education, I mean, and we were actually number one in Europe in educational software. So, um, I, I mean, it, but really, I mean, games. And even within games, um, I was looking at the numbers recently and in the, um, as part of doing this book, and towards the end, we were, um, uh, still something like 40% or 50% of revenue just in adventure games. So, yeah, a lot of people still remember Sierra as kind of the adventure game company. And uh, it's true. I mean, it, went, uh, it was a big chunk of our revenue throughout. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's, that's certainly what I remember Sierra for. I mean, I found, I found Leisure Suit Larry, sorry, Leisure Suit Larry, um, on the hard drive of my father's PC, which is an XT, you know, kind of like the thing. Uh -huh. I yeah. Monochrome monitor, you know, and it, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was very formative for me. I was pretty young at the time. And, and it just sort of, after, after I found that, my, my life, and I think that I speak for a lot of people who are watching this video, probably would you know, they would say that their lives were changed inexorably because of Sierra Games. Uh -huh. You know, if it wasn't for Leisure Suit Larry, um, then, you know, I probably wouldn't have got interested in IT. You know, so my whole career uh -huh. might not have happened because. So, you know, uh -huh. it, it really does, it really has shaped a lot of people's lives. If you think about it from that perspective, it's not just about uh -huh. games, you know, it really, really has changed a lot. So, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, this is 25 years since I sold Sierra. And yeah. um, I, I, mean, I can't believe I've been mean, all the fan sites and everything else. And um, yeah, all the people that say it really changed my life or got me interested in computers. And uh, I'm honored. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just amazing. I mean, who would have thought? Um, so all, of all the software that started Sierra, you know, obviously not just the, um, the games, but like you said, the applications, um, how much of that in the early days did you write? I'm assuming later on you didn't write all the games. No, you know, I didn't write very much. Um, I always wanted to. I was always jealous of our programmers because uh, I, I, you know, I would write code when I could. And when I saw an opportunity like... Um, Oh, and the Leisure Suit Larry games, all of the uh, gambling games like poker and stuff I wrote. On Hoyles, I wrote a lot they, oh, because things that you could get into quickly and just write some code. Mm. Um, at the very beginning, um, parts of AGI, uh, our, our interpretive language for running the games. But uh, so when I could, I would sneak in some code over the years. But it, it, I mean, it became kind of a large company at the end. We had a thousand employees scattered to. Um, oh, I don't know, 12 different locations. And to uh, manage all that, I was spending most of my life on airplanes and uh, running around looking at products. So I, I, would, yeah, I would get involved, but um, technically to give people ideas for how to do things. But um, yeah, I always felt like I was kind of the um, corporate bureaucrat, which I hated being, and uh, would have happily traded places with anybody working for me if I could have. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I've been in IT management now for at least 10 years. And, you know, looking back now, I look at all the people who are doing the DevOps stuff and coding and so forth. And I, and I do, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. I, I feel envious of them some of the times. Um, so, yeah, um, one of the things, I, this is a conflicting story. This is quite interesting. Um, 
some of the times I've heard people say that you're a, you're a hard ass, proper businessman. And then other times I heard stories about how you're just like a teddy bear. You were super nice to everybody. What, what's the truth? Is it somewhere in the middle or is it? Roberta and I were just debating that at dinner because there's a, a line in my book where I claimed I was a micromanager and uh, she was debating me on that and saying that I was kind of a puppy dog. And um, yeah, it was a little of both. I was, I, you know, I, I really, you know, I, I would claim I never really managed people that the numbers did. I, you know, I, I kind of, uh, part, lots, a lot of my career was in accounting and, um, and understanding um, spreadsheets. And, um, you know, I had kind of formulas for how much a division could spend and how much we could afford to spend on a product. And I would remind people of where we were at against their budgets from time to time. And I had a definite philosophy for how Sierra should run and what kind of products we should be in. And I had kind of a big picture vision for where I wanted to steer the company. And I, you know, I was pretty firm in that, um, you know, you hear, you hear people say, uh, and, and you think of them as evil, evil who say, you know, it's, it's my way or the highway. And I was a little bit of that in that I would say, you know, we all got to march the same direction. We all got to buy into a plan and we got to go implement it. Hmm. And um, if somebody wasn't going the right direction, although I, uh, I, was, I was kind of famous for always having a hatchet man uh, throughout, I would always have somebody who worked for me who was kind of my number two guy who um, I could say, go shut that project down or go, um, you know, go tell everybody they got to work 60 hours this week. Do they you know, totally work afraid for you? to do it myself. Um, <laughs> You know, even, um, yeah, because I, especially like, the, it was only a couple of times we ever had to do layoffs. And um, I'll tell you, that was hard on me. It, um, really, really um, tough. And without somebody that I could tell, here, go do that. If I'd had to do it personally, I think I had uh, I'd given up Sierra rather than face that. Mm. So, um, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm a, kind of a, all over the map, I guess, is the answer to that. Yeah, uh, it's really tough. When I started doing my IT career in management, I made a ton of mistakes because I was just foisted into it, right? I didn't know what I was doing. It just sort of happened. And um, I guess you were kind of foisted into you know, managing a company, managing, you know, you, you obviously started and it was just a few of you writing games, having a bit of fun, I'm presuming it was a bit of uh -huh. a lot, right? So, so then the, all of a sudden there was a day or a time where everything just kind of, blew up and you were this big, huge company or at least growing, uh, you know, did you make lots of mistakes, make small mistakes? No. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about the industry was that it was growing so fast that it was forgiving. I mean, it really was kind of on the job training. It, um, yeah, by any conventional standard, I'd have washed out in the first year or second year because we hadn't have any clue what we were doing. And, uh, and especially at the beginning, it, you know, if you've ever seen the book Hackers, I mean, it was kind of a, a party atmosphere at Sierra. Stephen Levy's and, book. Yeah, we, yeah, we got through it, though. And we, you know, at first I brought in professional management, and that didn't work because we were constantly undermining the guy and teasing him. And, um, but then we almost went out of business, and that, uh, that was kind of a, a maturing event. And, um, yeah, I, you know, over time you learn. And luckily, the industry was forgiving in those days and was growing at such a pace that even for the first few years, there was no, um, no sense whatsoever of competition. It was more um, the market could take product much faster than we could produce it or even the industry could produce it, So, which is different than today. I mean, today you can ship a product and get zero sales. It's so hard to break into the market, but that wasn't true then. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, luckily, um, you know, we kind of grew with the times. And by the end, I mean, we were a well-managed company. But we didn't start that way. So. Yeah, because you had, you had quite a few issues. You, you, you moved to Oakhurst, right? And you, mm -hmm. you leased that property or you bought that property. And it you know, obviously cost a lot of money. Um, but, but the company went into a bit of financial difficulties as a result of that in the early days. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I, well, let's see. I mean, we, I think it was about 1983, we decided to go into video games and uh, cartridges are expensive. We were doing, um, 
parts for, and some of it was for what we almost thought of as computers, the Atari 400, the uh, Commodore 64, the uh, TI-99, the VIC-20, um, and then some for the uh, Atari 2600. And um, w those cartridges were costing us like $15 a piece and you'd have to order them 5,000 or 10,000 at a time. And uh, we managed to uh, shut, well, we shut down computer development, built all those game cartridges, uh, loaded up the inventory, took in a lot of venture capital to pay for it all. And um, the market, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine how bad it fell apart. I mean, it, um, there was just no market whatsoever for any cartridge in 1983. And uh, that almost took the company under. Roberta and I were using our credit card to keep the company in business. And then uh, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time with um, IBM launching the PC Junior. And they gave us uh, uh, advances against royalties to produce product for them. And when the PC Junior bombed, um, Tandy had a uh, computer coming out that was supposed to be kind of the PC Junior killer. And, um, and in fact, it was. I mean, we basically took our PC Junior product um, over to uh, Radio Shack, which is, um, yeah, the makers of the Tandy computer. And um, it was a big hit. You know, we were, in a, we were in a fortunate position in that we had a lot of products we'd built for the PC Junior that uh, gave us a full product line. And when Tandy was trying to promote their computer, um, we were there ready and able to load up their stores. And, so Tandy, uh, Tandy was the savior then, really? That was what? Tandy was the savior then, was it? Oh, it was, yeah. Yeah, it, um, I mean, maybe we'd have come up with something else. I don't know, but uh, it was really a combination of uh, IBM funding the development of the products and uh, which never sold because the PC Junior bombed almost immediately. But uh, then we were able to put it on the uh, Tandy 1000 and sell to 6,000 Radio Shack stores. And uh, that put us on the map. Now, I don't think we ever had a losing quarter again after that. Everything was kind of straight up. That's great. So, and for the next, um, what was that, maybe another 15 years, everything was great. So, so um, with IBM, I mean, I, I often think of, you know, even back in the 80s, IBM is the big blue. It was hard to do business with IBM. And, and you know, there you are, you know, in this comparatively to IBM, you are a fledgling company, right? How, yeah. how did, you know, you manage to broker, I'm assuming it was you, how did you manage to broker a deal with big blue back in 82, 83? I, you know, I, I don't know. It, um they actually came to us for the IBM PC and wanted uh, Wizard and the Princess for it. But then for, and I don't remember why, they had us rename it to Adventures in Serenia. And um, I only even remember all this because I was, I just wrote that book and I had to research all this. Otherwise, I'd have told you, I don't know. But um, <laughs> they, uh, so they were already selling that one game for the PC. And when they, um, and I think it was the only game they had at the time or one of two or three. And when they were going to do the PC Junior, they split off a separate small group. I remember um, a guy named Don Estridge who started the PC Junior saying that, um, you know, because he wanted to compete with Apple who was starting to make inroads. And he said, if you want to compete with kids in a garage, you got to go build a garage. So he took kind of a small renegade group and went over to start um, a project to do the PC and then the PC Junior. And uh, the PC Junior, they kind of deliberately kind of dumbed down because they didn't want to, um, what do you call it, scavenge their IBM PC sales. So they did a really horrible keyboard for it. They didn't do a floppy drive for it, uh, or I think they did do a floppy drive, but it was, um, it was not a great machine. That chiclet and, keyboard, uh, wasn't it? It was horrible. Yeah, that chiclet keyboard. Oh. Yeah, so we didn't, and well, we didn't know because we had um, IBM PCs that were modified to uh, function like a PC Junior. But they really kind of came to us initially wanting um, just um, Adventure in Serenia, uh, which was Wizard and the Princess, adopted for the PC Junior. And it was at a time when, um, well, I think we actually started that project and that became King's Quest. Roberta, when she sat down to um, look at the uh, specs on the PC Junior, started asking, um, you know, can we do um, animation? And, um, and we looked at the specs of the machine. And I said, I think we can find a way. 
And uh, so then we started uh, growing that project and I did a demo of it for IBM and uh, blew them away. They were, they were super impressed. And I said, well, since you like that, I got other stuff I can sell you. <laughs> and I managed to broaden the relationship. And it was at the time when um, we had just laid off. Um, I think we were at the time at about 120 employees and we cut back to 20 or 25. So it was kind of an ugly time. And, um, but I was able to show, you know, because we had already started um, the King's Quest project and I was able to show IBM the demo. They loved it. And I said, okay, let's do more products. And uh, we signed them up for lots of other products to do um, with development advances. And that allowed us to rehire a lot of the people we had just laid off weeks before. Nice so great. it, um, yeah, we weren't shut down for very long or in on reduced staff. It might've been a couple of months, but then we were back in action and then never looked back after that. So um, to get King's Quest out the door, I mean, King's Quest 1 was built on AGI, right? That's so, built on AGI. And um, AGI was built for King's Quest. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, that, that at the time must have been revolutionary because I don't, I don't think, as far as I know, there was anything like, like that because you were building a platform, right? There was, there was nothing like a platform for, for games at all, right? Right. Now that was kind of, I guess, came out of my um, background working on the IBM mainframes and working with a language called uh, Pascal at the time. And that was an interpreted language that compiled to uh, P code, they called it. And um, it provided a level of machine independence versus coding and assembler. And I thought, boy, it'd be cool if I could do it because the hardware was moving so fast in those days. And I was trying to think, how can I kind of roll with the punches as the hardware changes? And how can I do things multi-platform? So um, I wanted to, um, yeah, compile to some sort of a um, imaginary machine language and then interpret it. And that also allowed me to do um, uh, low level device drivers for the different machines I could just plug in. And uh, yeah, and I, and I think it was because I came out of, um, out of a compiler development world and was used to programming languages. And um, yeah, if I'd come at it just from building games, probably Sierra would have been a way different company. But uh, it gave us kind of a big head start over competitors because um, we were much faster at being able to react to changes in the hardware world than our competitors were. Mm -hmm. So, and also we had much cheaper development costs and we could hire, um, programmers that weren't nearly as skilled, you know, in order to program in, uh, you know, a specific animation oriented high level language uh, to do a game, uh, you can move a heck of a lot faster than when you're trying to code an assembler. And there were no engines. I mean, like today, if somebody was going to build a game, first thing they'd do is look to see what engines are on the market. And um, in Sierra's case, we built our own proprietary engine and, um, yeah, could leverage it in new directions and enhance it as we pleased. Yeah, I mean, that, that it was, it was revolutionary. So, um, you know, back then, you know, people were coding in, you know, assembler, right? It was that the machine yeah. level. So um, with that then, so you said just a moment ago that you were bringing on developers who, you know, they weren't, you know, super developers. They, they, they could use the AGI um, system uh, rather than get, get on with coding. Uh, were these were these developers? Uh, were some of them creative people, as in they were more like um, storytellers or animation people or something like that, rather than okay, they might have had a little bit of coding, but also people who had that more creative kind of artistic kind of bent, or were they were they a bit of both? Well, different people at different times. In the very early days, um, like Al Lowe had been a school teacher and he programmed a couple of games in Basic for uh, preschoolers but he took to pretty quick programming in AGI and uh, did his own games. I think, um, well, probably his first three or four games, he coded himself. And then uh, the guy who did, um, oh, what was it? Uh, Ulysses and the Golden Fleece, uh, Bob Davis, I, he, had, he had no programming experience, but he picked up pretty quick on AGI and programmed that game. So, um, 
yeah, we did make it easy enough that uh, somebody who was smart and could learn basic programming could work in AGI, which wasn't that different, and uh, produce a game. Well, we were divided internally. We had a systems group and an application programming group, and the application programmers were programming in a high-level language and weren't that seasoned, and the systems group were kind of rock stars, and they were producing all the technology. And so, and so we, and we also had a tools group. We had kind of a third group to do, because in those days there were no paint programs. There were no, um, um, there was no text header, IDEs, I guess you'd call them. And um, there was, I mean, there was nothing. Uh, you know, if we wanted a paint program, we had to program it. So um, the fact that we uh, so early on, I mean, from the beginning had a tools group, an interpreter group, a compiler group, and an applications group, um, was very unique in the industry because this is, I mean, we're talking about 40 years ago. So. Yeah. It's, it's just unimaginable, I guess, today for, for people who develop software and, and started in the last sort of 20 years, but you know, yeah, I, can, I, I can understand it, but if it's you look at today's games. I mean, they're pretty mind blowing. I was just uh, looking at Microsoft flight simulator and just blown away at how amazing it looks. Yeah. So, but none of that hardware existed in those days. So we had to do what we had to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit then in, in Sierra, one of the things that really interested me um, was, you know, obviously you did all the software that was totally non-game related, but then there was the Sierra network. And yep. the Sierra network was, again, one of these things, you know, AGI was an innovation at the time that wasn't in the market, but... I, I also felt um, that there was nothing else like the Sierra network at the time. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I've, I've had, I still don't know if there's anything kind of as friendly or all-encompassing as what we did with the Sierra network. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine, but it was um, at least two or three years before I'd ever seen the first internet or connection to the internet. And we had flight simulators going, we had gambling games, we had kids games, we had, I don't know what, we had probably 50 games running on it. Um, and, and it was cool. It was pretty revolutionary. And um, even, uh, yeah, in the book I talk about Bill Gates personally calling it, he'd been playing um, bridge on it with Warren Buffett. And, uh, <laughs> of course. And said, you know, can we partner this thing or can I buy this thing? And, uh, and we should have partnered it with Microsoft. We partnered it with AT&T and um, that kind of killed it. It got bogged down in big company bureaucracy, but it was, um, yeah, it, it, it started. I mean, the original start came out of, um, I always had kind of a uh, crawl, walk, or walk, yeah, crawl, walk, run strategy in doing um, uh, revolutionary things. So I, I, I wanted to always, from the very beginning of Sierra, I wanted to do multiplayer games. And uh, finally, I kind of thought computers were getting there. And I uh, happened to be talking to my grandma at the time, who was whining about being stuck at home because she was getting old. And I said, you know, just a simple mission statement. I said, you know, what if, uh, what if a senior citizen could uh, pick up a game of bridge 24 hours a day, seven days a week? And... Um, and I called the thing um, Constant Companion. I kind of made a picture of a little box that looked like a um, VCR and um, knew that to put the thing together, I needed a network. So I talked to uh, the CEO of Sprint, which was a big phone company in those days, and talked to uh, the head of NEC and said, if you guys will give me the computers, then I'll do a test with a bunch of senior citizens and put up some online games or card games and uh, talk Sprint into giving me the network. And uh, we went to work coding and we put up uh, this thing called the Constant Companion and put it in um, the homes of uh, 50 people average 85, age 85. So, um, I mean, not only had no one seen multiplayer games, but these seniors had never seen a computer. Yeah. So I sent my guys out to set up computers in their homes. We set up the server in Oakhurst and, um, and it was the world's coolest thing because um, the server was blowing up all the time and it would overheat. I and mean, we were not running a data center. We were running computers in the back of the office. 
It was just one the, server. Uh, huh? Was it well, just it started with one server and it grew to a you know, wall full of servers. But uh, in fact, it grew to a room full of servers uh, finally. But we were, uh, but uh, during the early days, yeah, with the uh, seniors, it was just one server. And, um, and the seniors fell in love. I mean, they were addicted. When the thing would come offline, they would sit there for hours waiting for it to come back. <laughs> and it was acoustic modems. And in those days, we were dealing with 1,200 baud modems. In fact, probably a lot of the people were on 300 baud modems. Wow. It was dial up. You know, you get the dial tone and horrible. You're, you're old enough. You probably remember those days. I do indeed. Yeah. So yeah, also, that was, it was not fun, but, um, but we knew we had something. And, um, and so we started building it out and then we decided to rename it to the Sierra network because originally I wanted to focus everybody on the seniors because I knew that would get the user interface to be simple. And um, I really thought um, that it was important that we, and it, you know, even we had email on the thing. This was years before anybody was doing email. And we actually had uh, envelopes with cute little stamps on them you could buy. And it was, uh, yeah, it was really a fun thing. And yeah, we renamed it Sierra Network and it took off. It was, uh, yeah, it was a cool project. It, it was probably the proudest thing I ever did at Sierra. And um, I was just devastated when um, we did it with AT&T and it kind of got mucked up. And Well, what happened was the internet came along and um, we needed to transition all the low level stuff from working on our network to running over uh, internet. And that kind of bogged the whole thing down and um, yeah, and then somehow it just collapsed. Yeah, I was going to ask, I guess that what you did there um, was kind of before, I mean, TCP IP has been around since like the early 80s, but I'm assuming that, you know, it wasn't really a thing that people programmed with back in those days, unless you were on the ARPANET or something like that, right? So this was pre-internet. So you had to write your own network stack as yep. well, right? It's yeah, just... and, and, you know, I, I, I we kind of had a head start in that, um, I'd been doing that before I even started Sierra. So it, um, and I knew it was possible. I mean, part of it was, the, you know, having had the vision and um, been around lots of online networks. And um, yeah, I worked with a system called C CICS and IMSTC back in prehistoric ages. And, uh, and I don't even know if those things exist anymore, but um, I had the interest right from the beginning and we had the company name for it. Yeah, well, so, that's it. I was, I always wondered if online had anything to do with, you know, old school online, pre-internet online. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. It was, uh, I mean, even from the very, very beginning, it was what I was always thinking about when I saw modems and stuff, I said, we got to connect people together and start playing games and, um, yeah, we, have, we should have partnered with Microsoft instead of at and I think that's where it went wrong. Mm. But, um, oh, well, you know, 2020 hindsight. I'm, yeah. I, I'm not crying too bad. We, we turned out okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's fascinating. I, I really think there's something that's not covered enough. I, 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 I hats off to you guys for, for making something as, as, as yeah. clever as that. really was so far ahead of its time. All right, so in terms of uh, on, onto the games, what was your favorite Sierra game? I think everybody wants to know that one. Oh, you know, I, I'm not really a gamer, but I do like to have fun. I mean, I always loved, you know, Space Quest and Leisure Suit Larry for uh, adventure games. You know, Roberta would always be upset because I'd play Leisure Suit Larry and not play King's Quest, but Larry made me laugh, and mm. I thought that was fun. Um, Loved, you know, the games like um, uh, Red Baron from Dynamics and Aces Over the Pacific, the flight sims. Um, yeah, those were great. I, I spent a lot of hours on those. And uh, The Incredible Machine, a simple little product, but I thought that was just the, uh, you know, it, 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 it kind of making Rube Goldberg type devices. And that product just blew me away. Or yeah. Pinball, you know, from Dynamics. The Dynamics stuff was all pretty great. They, they did a good job. And, um, yeah, those were the kind of products I liked. I, I never got into, like, the impre uh, Art Division Impressions that did kind of the, uh, the board game type games. Um, never, never liked those. Never, um, 
never played any of the other, never any fantasy role-playing games or RPGs or never, never was into any of the shooting games. I even, I mean, obviously Half-Life was one of our biggest hits and I was always kind of, um, I didn't really love all the violence and blood and shooting and everything. I thought that was kind of bad for even the industry and um, bad for families. Mm. And uh, so I never, but I was never into playing it, but I certainly recognized that uh, customers liked it. And um, yeah, and the Half-Life was a big hit for us. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that was me. So. Fair enough. Um, so, so in Leisure Suit Larry and also Space Quest and Freddie Farkas, if I remember rightly, yeah. um, you appear um, in a number of cameos um, and some of the times you even ended up uh, as a bit of a butt of a joke. How did you, uh -huh. how did you go feeling? How did you feel about that? Uh, um, I really fought our programmers putting in, inside humor into the games. Um, if they were going to do it, then I, I it was, I, I I would whine, but let them get away with it. If it was me, they were poking fun at because customers at least knew who I was. But uh, sometimes they would put in, um, what do you call them, Easter eggs or hidden things um, on each other. And uh, I don't know, I didn't mind if people picked on me. It was kind of fun. And, and there's always a little um, truth in the humor. There's a lot of scenes where um, uh, it shows me cracking a whip or a guy named, um, uh, Rick Cavan, who was kind of my uh, hatchet guy, I guess you'd say, cracking a whip on people. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, people knew who I was, and I was kind of recognizable. And I had the mustache, which everybody always recognized. And uh, um, so I don't know. Yeah, it, it was funny. And I would even laugh at it. I mean, it was kind of, I don't know, I guess an honor to be picked on. So I just, um, I just remember um, Legend Suit Larry, the first one, and you know, finding it took me ages to read the graffiti on the wall, and then it was Ken oh. sent me. Yeah, um, Ken sent me a famous line, and I know it has been such a famous line. But um, you know, from that moment on, I knew who Ken Williams was. Right, uh -oh. that was that was yeah. it. And then at the end of the game, you walk on, and it's you and and uh, and and you know, like you're standing up there, and you're like, on behalf of Sierra, thanks very much for buying the game. And it was just, yeah, I was like, there's Ken Williams. Uh, <laughs> that that was one of the uh, yeah, I programmed the, it was my idea for the. Um, uh, there was a questionnaire at the start of Leisure Suit Larry, that was kind of funny and. Um, yeah, we'd ask them questions to kind of filter kids out from playing the game. And I remember coding that and uh, me and Al, uh, Al Lowe, who did it, staying up late at night trying to think of funny questions. But uh, that was cool. Yeah, I, I love the Leisure Suit Larry series. And when we, even when we were going public, it was funny because I had to go around and talk to uh, rooms of stockbrokers all over the country. And all I had to say was Leisure Suit Larry, and I, I own the audience. Those guys really um, seemed to love that game. <laughs> so they played it already. They played the first one, and then it was. Uh, oh, yeah. Everybody played Leisure. Even to this day, I mean, um, you know, the two games that people really recognize us for are, well, amongst the general public would be Leisure Suit Larry and Half-Life. And then if they're a gamer, they'll certainly know King's Quest. And um, those are kind of the big three that everybody knows. So yeah, absolutely, and and Space Quest, yeah. Um, so how did you go about meeting Al Lowe? I mean, what was, how did that come about? Did you just open for interviews and Al Lowe just came around, or Al came up to me at a trade show in San Francisco and had a couple of games he was selling himself, you know, just out of his house, ran an ad in a magazine, and they were called uh, Trolls Tales and Papa Bet. And like Sierra, they were sold uh, just on a floppy disk in a Ziploc bag with a little piece of paper. And um, they were, you know, and I was a um, teacher and Margaret, his wife was a teacher. And uh, the games were preschool level little action games written in basic, uh, pretty poor. But um, I don't know, I, I needed product, so I sold them for Al. And somehow out of all that, um, I'm trying to think of his very first game was Leisure Suit Larry. It seems like he did some stuff for us before that, but I don't know what he Black did. Cauldron? 
Is it Black Cauldron? Did he do that? Yeah, he did. He worked on Black Cauldron. And maybe that was before uh, Leisure Suit Larry. I think he, Roberta was kind of, um, I, w R Disney wanted Roberta to do uh, Black Cauldron. And um, she was busy working on King's Quest II, I think, because King's Quest had been such a hit. And, um, but Disney wanted her. And I, you know, and Al Lowe wanted to do a game. And uh, so Roberta said she had worked with Al Lowe, which really meant that uh, Roberta would handle Disney. So if they thought she was doing it, and Al Lowe would do all the real work with uh, Roberta directing. And uh, Al was great. And Black Cauldron turned out really great. And then he went on to do Leisure Suit Larry. It's quite was, a, yeah. <laughs> it's quite a transition to make, though, from, uh, I guess, preschool and being a teacher all of a sudden yeah. to making, you know, smarty games. <laughs> I remember when I asked Al to do it because it was a remake of a game called Soft Porn. And um, I don't know if I should tell this story, but Al um, <laughs> said he went to ask his... Uh, his, his preacher, if uh, if it was okay to do this change, and the preacher said, "Do I get ten <laughs> percent?" I don't know if that's a true story, but that's a story uh, Al told me at the time. That sounds yeah. like an Al Lowe story. Yeah, yeah, he uh, <laughs> is a great guy. He's a funny guy, and he was the right guy to do it. And um, yeah, and it's really pretty close to the original uh, soft porn adventure that that was remade from. So yeah, great product. The, the, yeah, um, I don't know who came up with the name Leisure Suit Larry. It might have been my brother. Him and Alf debate which of them came up with that name. Wow. But funny name. It's a definitely great name. I mean, it just yeah. sticks, doesn't it? Um, and, and what about um, Mark and Scott? How did, you, how did that happen? How did they come about? Mark Pro was a, one of the two guys, was an artist on some project. And Scott Murphy was, I think, quality assurance for us, testing games. And the two of them wanted to pitch me on doing a Space Quest game and did a little demo and um, kind of came into my office one day and said, check this out. And it was um, basically the first scene or two from uh, Space Quest 1, but just animated, no code behind it or anything. And they said... Um, this is pretty funny. And I saw it. I, I laughed. I thought it was a pretty cool demo. And I said, okay, you guys win and gave them a budget to do a game and assigned them a team. And at that time, I mean, teams, you know, a team would be three people or four people. It wasn't, uh, wasn't big teams. Mm. And um, so, yeah, they pitched me and um, um, I was just reading a memo. They did, I think the first four together. And then for five, they kind of, their, um, their personal relationship wasn't working out so good. And Mark went down to Dynamics and was actually there and did Space Quest V without Scott and uh, wasn't as good a game. You know, it's really the two of them together that, because uh, they have such different personalities. Mark was real um, uh, solid, mature, and uh, Scott was kind of wild and crazy and a little off the wall and super sarcastic. And you put kind of the, uh, you know, the two completely different guys together and what comes out is really creative and amazing. So they, they, they were fun. Yeah. Just like all the good bands and all, all the rest. It's always the, yeah. you know, the opposite. It was actually kind of rotten for me because, um, you know, I would love the game and I would go down and look over somebody's shoulder and I would have to do the uh, product reviews on it. So by the time it was done, I had already seen it in various bits and pieces. And I never got to really experience it the way somebody at home would, where they get a finished game and it's not crashing every five minutes. And um, yeah, so I've always felt disappointed. They, they're, they're coming out with a uh, Kickstarter version of uh, Space Quest that's been um, in development for like four years. But um, I just recently got a beta test of it and I'm looking forward to playing it. So I think they're like either released now or very close to release. That's awesome. It's so It'll be my first time to get to actually play Space Quest as a uh, as a player. So. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. And um, I played the uh, the Kickstarter version of Leisure Suit Larry when Al will get back into his one as well. Oh, it's really great so to, to see that. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, you know, you were saying there that uh, typical projects, you know, you'd have at the beginning, there would be like three or four people on the project team. Um, how long would a game at that point take to, to make? No, oh, under six months, you know, three months to six months. And um, yeah, and by the end, I mean, King's Quest Eight took uh, three years. And uh, Phantasmagoria probably took three years. So, you know, and by the end, projects were, you know, 50 and 60 people. So it, uh, it, it just kind of grew. And I'd imagine today, I mean, to compete in today's world, it's got to be, you know, hundreds of people that are working on these projects. Mm. It's a Hollywood so, movie, isn't it, really? Well, yeah. yeah, in fact, it's bigger than a Hollywood movie. The uh, script for, you know, the average Hollywood movie might be, you know, 70 or 80 pages, whereas the script for, like, Phantasmagoria was probably 400 pages, 500 pages. And it's because you've got to film all the alternate stuff. You know, whereas in a, um, in a normal movie, you were, um, you know, 90 minutes in and out, and nobody sidetracks. So when we were filming Phantasmagoria or Gabriel Knight uh, two or three, where we used live actors, it was it was you know thick uh, binders for the script and um, months of shooting, so not easy. So would would you say that the earlier games were more fun for you personally to work on, or would you say that you know the later on it, did you have a particular favorite? Yeah. Um, well, for me personally, toward the end, it just got um, worse and worse in that um, toward the end, we'd always have 60 or 70 games in development at any point in time. And what I would do would be um, quarterly product reviews. And what would I'd set up an entire month just for looking at product. And I would have to fly to each of our divisions. And you know, one of them was in Paris and one in London and a couple in Boston and some in um, Seattle and some in Oakhurst and some in uh, California and some in Utah. And so I was flying all over the place and I would show up and each team would come in and do a presentation to me of their game. And I would look at where the budget was, look at what I saw in the product, try to think about uh, what, you know, because it, they, they would invariably say, oh yeah, no, we're on track to ship it on time. And I would have to challenge them to figure out if it was really gonna ship on time or not and um, look at how much money had been spent versus the total projected budget for the product. And I was always the villain. I mean, in some ways, uh, you know, I had a tough job in that um, I never got to say anything nice to somebody. I mean, I would ooh and awe ah when I saw a cool technology, but an awful lot of it was telling people, you know, what do we got to cut in order to pull this thing in on, on budget? And, um, you know, and, and I say in the book that, you know, I was always kind of considered the... Um, you know, the corporate idiot that would show up and uh, in 15 minutes think I know their game better than them. But that was really my job. You know, that's what I kind of had to do was look at the product and figure out where it's at. And it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't nearly as much fun as if I could have sat home and actually played a game. Um, but yeah, I'd show up, I'd spend days in meetings looking at a new product every, you know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes and then go out back to the airplane for the next batch. You know, working with these developers, they, they, they don't really have an appreciation of what it is to be in a position like you were, you know, they just want to code and, you know, it's, so it's real tough. I, I get it. I do. So uh, I remember playing Space Quest 3 and at the end there was, uh, you know, the Red Sierra building, which was, you know, I guess up in Oakhurst. And it was, you know, it's such a lovely sort of, you know, I've, I've seen photographs, so it's right up there in the woods and, you know, it just looked yeah. lovely. Um, and obviously a crazy place to have a software company but you know in the same token it's really nice so um obviously you, you guys moved to seattle in uh -huh. what 93 something like that was it yeah, I think 93 was it sad leaving uh Oakhurst and going to seattle obviously it was a, a business decision in the end right no i mean it was good and bad i mean it's so beautiful there but seattle in those days was really beautiful seattle's gotten a little more challenged lately but um but um yeah, it was a horrible place to try to run a business. We had trouble hiring people. We had trouble, um, well, and, and as much as I was flying, and uh, there was an airport in Fresno, but it was constantly fogging in. So in order for me to go anywhere, it was actually faster to drive to San Francisco, which was a, um, 
three and a half hour drive versus one to Fresno, but um, at least I could count on the flights usually going out of San Francisco to where I wanted to be. So it was like every week I was having to drive, you know, three hours each way to go to San Francisco to fly somewhere. And it just got old. And when we were trying to hire good management, because I thought um, I, I, I was, uh, I, it was kind of me and kind of a second tier that was, um, yeah, it was good for, it was certainly the best in Oakhurst, but you know, the best in Seattle can be better than the best in Oakhurst. There's more companies to uh, pick from. And so in order for the company to get as big as I wanted to take it, I had to move the company someplace uh, bigger. Yeah. You know? And Microsoft did just fine in Seattle. So I figured, uh, and, and at that point, um, I thought that I could pick off some of their people. They kind of hit kind of a stretch where they were a little bit stagnant and uh, thought it would be good to be in Seattle and recruiting away from companies like Microsoft. Did you get a few over from Microsoft in the end? Yeah, we got a few, not as many as I thought, but there was a lot more in, happening in technology in Seattle than I thought. Mm. Um, a lot of companies uh, were Microsoft in the early, early days generated a lot of Microsoft millionaires, they were calling them, because they had had stock options. They spun off and they started all these small technology startups. And um, that brought a lot of technical talent to Seattle. And uh, it was good. I mean, we really exploded once we moved to Seattle and were able to get some really um, good salespeople, good everything, good finance people. Um, you know, the company is almost like it had been held back and all of a sudden it just took off and did really well. That's so. great. Uh, look, I don't want to keep you too much lo longer because I do appreciate that um, we've probably been on the phone. You're going to get me in trouble with Roberta. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really, I'll, I'll shut up then. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, just quickly then, do you guys ever um, think about having a little reunion or have you had one already? Just like the, you know, the, the main stairs, I guess, Al Lowe and Scott and Mark. And yeah, yeah, there's been a few Sierra reunions, but Roberta and I are never around. We're kind of hard people to pin down. We... Um, um, after Sierra, we bought a boat and circumnavigated it. So we're, you know, like five or six months a year on a boat. And then we were living for uh, 20 years in Mexico. So um, that, uh, <laughs> that, that's a long way to go to try to attend any kind of Sierra reunion. So they'd have them and I'd know about it. But uh, no, plus we're not, we're not as nostalgic as we should be. I guess we're, um, you know, I, I kind of... Uh, it, almost got a second 15 minutes of fame in boating and um, wound up writing uh, four books about uh, boating and there's almost no marina in the world I can go into where somebody won't come up and say are you Ken Williams and it's uh, got to do with our boating adventure yeah. we were the cover of virtually every boating magazine when we <laughs> crossed the Atlantic or we went across the Bering Sea and we've done all kinds of crazy stuff so um, yeah Sierra be. just feels a long time ago yeah, well, I, I guess it was in, in many respects. Um, it must be weird, though, sometimes going up and, uh, and seeing people going, hey, this is Ken Williams, and you yeah. wonder whether this person's going to say, uh, yeah, I know you from the boating, or I know you from Sierra, you know, yeah. like, which we one is to, it? We have to do that. We have to say, you know, um, <laughs> I was standing in front of Amazon one day, and it was a kid, and I assumed it was a, a gamer. They know us from boating. So, uh, it, uh, yeah, you have to ask people, uh, how do you know me? But um, because between me and Roberta, we're pretty recognizable, I guess. But well, oh, that's yeah. it, you know, and, and that's one of the great things about Sierra, and of, I guess now with your boating, right? But you're a you're a brand, right? It, it was Ken and Roberta, and everybody knew that you, you know, you had your names on all the boxes, and it, you know, yeah. it was a it was a name not just Sierra, but Ken and Roberta that you could you could trust that were you know were delivering quality games. It was really great. I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll do a small plug for my book. That, yeah, that was uh, my next question. <laughs> part, of, part of why, I, yeah, part of why I'm even uh, thinking about Sierra after many years of not thinking about it was, uh, well, what happened was because of this virus thing, I wasn't, uh, we were planned on being on our boat all summer, but that got shut down because of the virus. So um, Roberta, I was, I was kind of like I had nothing to do. And she said, why don't you write a book? And so I didn't know what to write about because I only knew boats in Sierra and I'd already done some boating books and uh, said, well, maybe I'll write something about Sierra. And, um, and it, it, the book that I wrote, it's uh, kind of the history of Sierra, but I would say it's um, 
also more of a business book. It talks about um, the strategies, you know, like what made Sierra Sierra and uh, why it was so unique. And, um, you know, it talks about our brand strategy. I mean, I, I, in some ways, people will hate the book because they'll buy it and they'll be looking for Leisure Suit Larry or King's Quest or Space Quest. And uh, there's a little of that in there, but really it's mostly um, what did we do uniquely that made it a company that even though it had in effect stopped 25 years ago, that there's still people that remember the company. And, uh, and it talks about, I mean, I did kind of try to run Sierra like a fan club and, um, and we invested heavily in customers. Once somebody was in the family and bought a Sierra product, you know, we would look at it and it sounds terrible to say, but I would compute what do I think the lifetime value of that customer is and how much should I spend to acquire them and how much should I spend each year to kind of keep them in the family. And then I knew that as long as I gave them good products, and if they're going to spend a hundred dollars, then, you know, we want 75 of it coming our way. And, um, and, and all the strategies we use to do that is what I talk about in the book. And, um, I don't know if people like it or not. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it up to them whether they like it or not. But it's certainly, there's so many books that have been written about Sierra. And, uh, you know, in fact, I just read a book called uh, The Sierra Adventure that was, um, I was reading it. I was thinking, how do they know all this? Because <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the book, but wow. I, I think the guy, uh, you must have interviewed, you know, 100 people or something for the book. Oh, I read the whole thing cover to cover tonight. It was, it was kind of, cool because I um, brought back a lot of memories and um, and I do miss the Sierra days. It was fun to build games mm -hmm. and um, well, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. So um, yeah, if anybody's interested in my book, then look for it. And it's uh, Ken's book.com. Yeah. And it's, out, it's out next month. Is that right? Yeah, it, um, I, I sent 50 copies to uh, ex-Sierra people trying to get it right. Even um, uh, after we left the company, I was. It, it's so funny because these people I haven't connected with in years. Um, uh, Dave Grenowetsky, who took over the company after, um, after the whole collapse and had, was left to clean up the mess or try to. And I've uh, been talking to him and I, I just been going and I talked to Mike. Uh, Brochu, who was our president, and talked to Jerry Bowerman, who run development. And these are a lot of people I haven't talked to in 25 years. So it's been kind of uh, almost like a Sierra reunion, just doing the research for the book. I mean, I mean there will be so many people looking looking forward to it. And, and just, just talking about that part about how, you know, you're, you're saying it's about, some of it is about the business. Oh, I mean, I think the thing is to, to note on that is that you were a very shrewd businessman in that regard. But if it wasn't for the fact that you were such a shrewd businessman, then Sierra would have never have made all the great games that they did. It wouldn't, yeah. you know, it, it, Sierra would have been a very different place and a very, all the titles. You needed somebody behind all of that to make the machine work, to, to make all the games yeah. and to keep all the customers. So it's really important. Well, we were lucky too, because we had an early leadership position. And if you were in the game industry in those days, you wanted to work for Sierra. So we were, you know, we were able to get the best and the brightest people, whereas, and we didn't have to fight to get them. People wanted to come to us. So it was, um, yeah, it was a rare opportunity to work with kind of as good a developers as the game industry had. So, yeah, no, I, I, I it, was, it was easy to succeed when you were surrounded by those kinds of people. So that was, uh, that was good. Look, Ken, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, but I have been on the call with you for far too long already. So I please send Roberto my apologies. Um, your book is coming out next month. It's called yep. Not All Fairy Tales Have Happy Endings. Make sure you go on to, uh, what, what's the website again? Kensbook.com. I know, I, was, I, I actually have the, brand name, or the website name, wizardandprincess.com, but uh, Roberta said, nah, people figure out Ken's book. So anyway. Okay, anyway, thank you. It's no, been a pleasure. Yes, it has been a love. It's been so lovely to speak to you, Ken. I really appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. And Take thank care. you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> See you. Bye.